Okay, well, in case you missed the initial introduction, my name is David Pertaub, and uh, I'm a researcher at uh, the Climate Change Group at IIED. I'm the moderator for this session, and uh, I'll be doing an introduction for the session as well. Uh, welcome to the Skillshare on the Pomoja Voices tool to support inclusive climate resilient planning for communities. Um, marginalized groups often depend very heavily on natural resources which are greatly affected by climate change, but they often have, because they're marginalized, very little say in community decision making processes. Tools can be participatory without being inclusive. Perhaps it's the most powerful or dominant in the community who speak loudest or who are invited even to the workshops. How do we get around this? And how do we develop tools which are not too complex or complicated for local practitioners with perhaps limited resources to use effectively? That's kind of the backdrop behind the Pomoja Voices toolkits. Just to give a little bit of background, they were developed as part of the Strengthening Women and Youth Voices for Climate Action in Tanzania project, which was funded by the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. Uh, this project ran from 2018 and is still running, but just about to come to an end. One of the aims of this project was to develop an affordable, straightforward, inclusive planning toolkit for use by local climate practitioners in Tanzania. Now, the project developed two versions or flavors, if you will, of the toolkit for two very, very different settings. One was pastoralist and agro-pastoralist communities in Northern Tanzania. And the other was small producer communities and cooperatives, rather cooperatives in Zanzibar. The toolkits were designed and tested as part of a collaboration between IIED and two Tanzanian and two Zanzibari community-based partners. You'll see their logos here. From pastoralist areas in Arusha district, we have Bawakimo and Pastoralist Women's Council. They're both community-based organizations working to improve the lives of pastoralist women. We're lucky today to have representatives from both these organizations in the meeting. You'll see them in the participants list. Angela Kigashi from Bawakimo and Sarah Alakara from the Pastoral Women's Council. Our partners in Zanzibar were the Pomoja Youth Initiative, an independent youth-led organization, and the Zanzibar Climate Change Alliance, or ZACA for short, an umbrella of civil society organizations committed to working on environment and climate change in Zanzibar. And today we're lucky to be joined by Rashid Mawinyi of Pomoja Youth Initiative. For today's session, uh, I'll be kicking off briefly by discussing tools for community climate risk assessment. I'll then pass you over to my colleague at IIED, Sarah McIver, and she'll tell you all about the nuts and bolts of the uh, planning toolkits. Um, then Angela Kigashi of Bawakimo will tell us about her organization's experience of developing and using the toolkits in Arusha in Northern Tanzania. Rashid Mwinyi will tell us about his experience of using the tool in Zanzibar, and then we'll finish up with a question and answer session. Uh, of course, you can ask a question or make a comment at any time in the chat box. Um, we won't address them while the uh, presentations are going on, but we will look at them and address them in turn uh, in the question and answer session towards the end. Now, the next stage, we'd like to find out a little bit about the toolkits and the tools that you're familiar with and currently use as climate practitioners. The tools that you're using today to assess climate vulnerability and climate risk in the communities that you're working with. These go by a variety of different names. Um, sometimes they're called resilience assessments, sometimes they're vulnerability assessments or capability assessments. Um, this is just a quick chat chat. We just wanna see if you write down the names of any tool or toolkits you're familiar with or already using into the chat box. And then after that, after you've written the name, put a score. Just write down a score from zero to five, where five is the maximum. How effective you think that tool is at capturing the experiences and priorities of marginalized groups in the communities you work with. So it's an inclusiveness score. So just take a moment to write in the chat box um, some of the tools that you're familiar with and how effective you think they are at, uh, at capturing inclusiveness.
Let's have a look at that. Well, we've got a couple of comments coming in. Yep, okay. The ICLEI Resilience Toolkit. Okay, that's interesting. We can discuss that a little bit more later towards the end in the discussion. Um, just for avoidance of doubt, I'll just tell you what the toolkit means to us as Pomoja, as a Pomoja toolkit. Um, basically, what we're referring to as a toolkit, it's two freely available documents that are available on the web that provide step-by-step -step instructions and guidance on how to conduct climate resilience assessments that are inclusive. So they feature a collection of specially selected participatory rural appraisal exercises, which together, when used in a particular way, can bring out the specific climate resilience priorities of women and young people. They also provide straightforward, comprehensive, and we hope simple instructions on how to organize your workshops, how to choose participants, tips on how to facilitate, tips on how to work with translators, and even some ideas on how you might report afterwards and produce um, a document that um, actually presents the results of the assessment in a meaningful way. Um, the toolkits are currently available in English. They're posted, we just posted them on the internet. So they've just gone live. Uh, I'll give you the addresses, the online addresses at the end of the session, um, but uh, we hope you'll take a look. Um, the toolkits are also going to be available in Swahili shortly. Um, the translations have just been done. They're not quite ready yet, but they will soon be ready. So that's the brief overview. Uh, you now know what the Pomoja toolkits are roughly about. I'll pass you on to Sarah McIver, who will give you much more detail on the nuts and bolts of the Pomoja Voices toolkits. Thanks very much, David. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Um, so my name is Sarah and I'm just going to go through a quick overview of these two toolkits um, that David has outlined. Um, I'll start by indicating um, what Pamoja actually means. So Pamoja means together in Swahili um, and it was very much determined by the partners where they felt that this should be about voices coming together. This toolkit is about you know bringing all these different voices from women, from youth, from marginalized uh, communities together. So it's really under that framework of inclusion um that kind of forms the basis of this this toolkit um what is it as david mentioned very simple straightforward um step-by-step -step guides um a few exercises and activities that have been developed basically to ensure the climate priorities um of women and youth and men as well are identified um, the challenges that they face in dealing with the change in climate, um, but also allowing them, enabling them um, the opportunity to share their solutions as well. Um, so very much bottom up processes, the challenges they're facing, um, but the solutions that they feel would, would help them in overcoming uh, such challenges. Um, why is it needed? Um, there's very much recognition and increasing recognition of the failure of existing climate and development programs. Um, to, to recognize the different challenges facing um, ev you know, everyone, but in particular women and youth. Um, often development programs or climate programs are, are there to support a community and they see community as, as, as something that is one thing. Um, but we all understand that it's not, you know, within a community, there will be different power dynamics operating. Um, there will be elites as well. Uh, there will be those that are marginalized. So this toolkit is really about trying to level the playing field, um, ensure the voices of those that are marginalized have a say at the table and are also involved in the decision making. Um, as, it's, as often it's these very people that are marginalized are the ones who are suffering most from climate change. So it's really important that they are they have a say and they are part of the planning and decision making as well. Um, what is the outcome? So what, what, what would happen once you apply these toolkits, basically um, a collective action plan would be developed um, and that action plan would have been developed by the communities, um, capturing sort of the, the gender and climate priorities um, from the local solutions and the equal perspectives of women, men and youth. 
Um, and it can be used by a wide range of different organizations and actors. Um, it can be used by local communities themselves, uh, by cooperatives themselves, um, but also those organizations that support them. So whether that's national or local government, civil society or community-based organizations, academia and think tanks, um, as well as donors and, and private sector, it's, it's been particularly made to be very flexible so that it can adapt um, to be used by a different range of users. Um, and in terms of the time frame, it only takes about three days to do. Um, so very short time frame. Um, it's quite very kind of cost effective as well. Um, but we would argue that it's so important to do such exercises. They can be done as part of baselines at the start of a program to really inform the different priorities of, of women, youth, marginalized groups as well. Um, so we would argue that it's worth it, you know, three days um, to do this um, would be in, in, invaluable to the whole development program and to an intervention, um, ensuring um, that the voices of all are heard would really be a really important exercise um, that would be indeed a worthwhile investment for the effectiveness of programs. Um, the first um, toolkit, um, so on to the next slide, David, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first toolkit that was developed, um, these toolkits were very much bottom up. Um, so we worked in two different areas. We worked in mainland Tanzania in Mondulu and Longiru district. And we also worked in Zanzibar. Um, and we wanted to, it to be bottom up processes. So we allowed for the communities themselves to inform what the toolkit should have as part of them. Um, so it wasn't top down. Um, it was very much the communities were involved at all stages in planning the toolkit development, in designing it, in testing it in the field in validating the, the final product that was developed and in training others as well on how to use it. Um, so it's really, they've been involved throughout the whole process. And we feel that the toolkits are quite unique in that regard because they've been tested and adapted by the users themselves. Um, so this first toolkit um, was working with pastoralists um, in Northern Tanzania. Um, it involves six exercises or activities um, which involve um, climate risk assessments, gender analysis, theories of change and stakeholder mapping. Um, and all of those are very straightforward. Uh, the toolkits include very simple step-by-step -step guides on how to conduct all of these activities. Um, but a key part of it all is that there is a, the, the importance of creating the safe space. So, all of the toolkits kind of fo focus on having focus group discussions um, with older men, older women, younger men and younger women, um, so that they have the chance to, to share their challenges in a safer environment, one in which they're more comfortable, uh, share some of the solutions they can offer in dealing with their day-to-day -day gender constraints, uh, in dealing with their day-to-day -day climate challenges, um, and then bringing everyone together um, in order to develop a collective solutions and an action plan in order to deal with such challenges um, together. Um, the slides show some of the images that are also available in the toolkit. So you can see it's very much um, trying to be as inclusive as possible using um, quite innovative techniques um, of drawings um, and allowing the, the communities to draw the, the seasonal calendars themselves to really outline um, how the climate is affecting them and to think about historical climate changes um, as well as think about sort of some key interventions from the theory of change that can help inform uh, their building of their livelihood resilience. Um, next slide. Um, the second toolkit, this was the one that was developed in Zanzibar working with cooperatives. Um, so this is slightly different again because it's a different context. So the communities felt that they wanted to um, have these exercises as, as part of their toolkit. Um, similar to the previous one, also the gender analysis, climate risk assessments being key to this one. Um, it also involves having the four focus groups um, divided into um, older men, older women, younger men um, and younger women as well um, to hear the challenges and priorities that were that they were uh, being faced with and some of the collective solutions. Um, the gender analysis, they were able to sort of conduct a timeline to outline some of the challenges they were facing, um, discuss who controlled resources, who had access to resources, and discuss some of the weather hazards that were affecting their activities as well. Um, and then to come together and develop this cooperative action plan, one that they would implement themselves um, and continue to monitor. Um, this one also involved a governance analysis, so really using 
um, looking at the current leadership structures, how many men were in the leadership committee, how many women, how many youth, um, looking at the desired composition and then thinking about where, where they'd like to go in the future. So having a very collective discussion about how they would like to ensure that there isn't any gaps in their structures and the voices of all are included in those decision making processes. Um, as you can see, very simple, very straightforward. Um, a, a lot of use of diagrams and drawings um, to ensure full involvement of, of, of the community. Um, I'm going to stop here and hand over, hand over to Angela. So she's going to take us through in more detail about the work that they've done in mainland Tanzania, um, working with pastoralist communities. Angela, over to you. Hello, Angela. Just checking to see, Angela. Angela, you may be on mute. Angela? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you're on mute. <laughs> okay, you're now live. Hello everyone, I'm Angela Kagashi from Bawakimu, Monduli Women Forum, working in Arusha, Tanzania, particularly in the Monduli district. I'm here to take you through the inclusive climate planning process that we did with the rural pastoralist communities in the Monduli and the Longido district. Thank you. The next slide. Um, as said, I've taken you through we had several activities that has led us to identify several challenges that has been, that is facing community, especially women and youth in the pastoralist community. Uh, by this, we found that youth and women are very vulnerable to climate change shocks because they are depending much from men to attain their their livelihood and by this means that traditional roles of women and youth are quite different from other people in the community they have a lot of responsibility and they have a, they have they are not they are not having power in decision making in order to re, re, fulfill those responsibility and this has led them to to be dis discriminated among the community as people who are weak and people who do not have a resilience capacity. They depend much on natural resources in the environment which are attacked by the climate environment, climatic change that are taking place all over the world. And this has led to much lowering their resiliency capacity in the, in the community. Lack of voice of the influence to reduce the climate resilience of women and youth and triggering rural and urban migration in search of other opportunities, especially economic opportunities that are available in the urban areas. Thus leaving the old and young, young very, very young children at home, that's not helping the community to move forward. Uh, the other challenge, we thought that limited access to social services, particularly water, especially to women, proved to be a challenge because they spend much time fetching water, not engaging in other development activities that will really somehow bring in income to sustain the family or in the household at, at the, at the, on, on, on general. The next slide. Uh, working with the different groups during the meeting has led us to identify different priorities for both groups. We had young women, we had older women, as well as young men and older men. Every group had its own resilient priority, which 
which when working together, they thought that if it is taken care of, the capacity or the resilient capacity will increase. To start with younger women, they, they thought that having water nearby household or nearby homestead will prove to be, will increase their resiliency capacity in the, during climate condition changing. And this is for household as well. And at, at the same time, household water for livestock that remain at home, especially when men are moving around with livestock that are, are stable. And live, livestock, women and young girls depend on milk and other milk products to earn money for household consumption. Uh, we also have small businesses whereby having small business around proved to, to increase an income of we, young women around so that they can they can sustain their livelihood when men are not around and since they do not have ownership of anything they have access but they, they don't have ownership this small business gives them little money to provide for their own needs as well as the household need. Engaging in Vicoba, saving and lending groups proved to be a successful and a resilient priority for women and in particular and young girls because it will provide them with the opportunity to interact with others as well as save money and do other businesses that will bring in income for the family. They also prioritize on land for farming and cultivation, because at the end of the day, women in a, in a pastoralist community do not own land. What they have access to is to, they do not have ownership of land from their father's side. And on their husband's side, they are allowed on to use the land, but they do not have say on what the products are coming out of the farm. The man is the one who have the final say on the products. When we come to older women, they prioritize water for domestic use as well as for livestock. And they insisted on food saving and store to cater for during dry season and when men are moving away with livestock. They also insisted on livestock, particularly because they depend much on the products that are coming from livestock, telecommunication to ensure that everyone in the community is able to have information from anywhere so that they know where the marketplace are, what is taking place in the, the world. The young men insisted on education, education, the aspect of farming as well as livestock keeping and insisted on businesses having water to water the livestock and the livestock for their own livelihood sustainability. Older men priorities included livestock and by livestock they required to have enough water and the pastures for grazing the livestock. They insisted on mobility of livestock moving from one place to, to another in search for pastures and markets to sell the livestock because they depend much on livestock to earn money and buy product or food for the household. Next slide, please. Uh, during our work in implementing the Pamoja Voice tool in Monduli, we found that this tool has been able to include everyone in the community. Uh, First for women and youth were not taking place, were not given opportunity to make decision, decision making bodies. Take an example at household level, local government as well as traditional structures, which are very strong in the pastoral communities, but having the Pamoja voice tool around, it has given an opportunity for them to voice up their mind and take part in decision making. Uh, the tool has also helped in the community, making the community aware 
as well as support and include, and include the women and youth priorities in planning, development, investment. Um, in the, our community, what we normally do, the, inve the, investment, the development investment planning takes place from the village level. And by this, since they, the local government did not involve much of the women and the youth, but by using the Pamoja Tool Voice tool, the community now is aware that they have they have the responsibility to to plan and uh, implement different climatic change projects. Uh, the Pamoja Voice Tool has well has enabled many swimming women and youth climatically resilient priorities into traditional structures agendas. By this we mean that the community as it is, it has strong hold, strong hold of traditions, whereby men are the one who are making decision on behalf of the whole community. So by understanding that women and youth also have priorities, which will help, which will help them in adapting to climate change, then they have started including and taking in the in the involving them in the climate in the decision making structures in the traditional way uh the other issues about women and youth have, have also realized that they have a role to play in changing the stigma around the community concerning women and the youth involvement the next slide so far the lesson learned we learned that during the whole time, persons women uh, and youth are more effective in determining to push for change. And the tool is successful in showing the distinctive livelihood and responsibility of women and youth and the challenge they face. And it provided a room to women and youth to identify their climate resilient priorities. Uh, I welcome my colleague, Rashid, to carry on with the next slide. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Rashid Mwinyi uh, from Pamoja Youth Initiative, working as a chairperson. And Pamoja Youth Initiative is a, a local organization uh, uh, with the mission of strengthening Zanzibari youth to understand their potentialities toward bringing positive changes in their communities. Um, today, uh, we'll just present uh, Pamoja Voices uh, toolkit. Uh, that is um, have a theme of make sure that there is inclusion of climate resilience and planning for corporate uh, cooperatives. Next slide, David. Yeah, the second Pamoja Voices Toolkit was developed by engaging three grassroots cooperatives, which is Shauri Moja, who are keeping bees, to desert who are line farmers and shurikan circles that are dealing with seaweed farming in connection with the government of Zanzibar's Department of uh, Cooperative Development. Um, why uh, we decided to deal with these uh, three co local cooperatives? Uh, some of the challenges facing these cooperatives are the cooperatives are neg negatively impacted by climate change in their day-to-day -day livelihood activities. Um, Talking about lime farmers who are getting a very difficult time, uh, especially during the dry seasons. They cannot produce anything as the lime become dried. And also talking about beekeepers, also they are also affected and um, sea, um, um, seaweed farmers, they also affected as now uh, the temperature is increased they cannot keep up producing much in lower water or shallow water, and they are supposed to move to deep water. Um, also, women and youth are often excluded from the key decision-making forum, determining how much climate changes should be overcome. Um, according to different researches, show that uh, women and youth are muchly affected with climate changes, 
but they cannot uh, take part in provide any decision regarding the, uh, themselves due to the effects of these climate changes. Uh, last but not least, women and youth encounter obstacles to accessing resources, information, skills, and knowledges. Um, uh, in most of these uh, local cooperatives, women um, face a lot of obstacles which hinder them uh, in different uh, aspects of their life, especially getting the land for productions and assessing some in, uh, important information that can help them in their life. David, next slide. How the toolkit helps women and the youth to express themselves and prior priorities. The toolkit has enabled women and the youth to take part in decision-making bodies and a process in their respective communities. Youth and the women are now possess top leadership position in their cooperatives. Uh, before um, using these tools in their cooperatives, you could find there even uh, no, there is no even a, a single women, woman or a single youth in the cooperative leadership structures. But after using this cooperative, um, uh, women and youth have been taking uh, top leadership positions. For instance, uh, at uh, uh, Sharikani Circles, we are dealing with lime farming, with uh, seaweed farming. Now, a treasurer is a woman. Uh, also, the toolkit have the identifying the priorities of women, men, boys, and girls in terms of overcoming gender constraints and climate changes, as well as determining collective solutions. For instance, through this toolkit, um, members of Shurikani Circles, women identified their uh, requirement for them to go to deep water for seaweed farming. We will see on the next slide. Take me to the next slide, David. Yes, climate resiliency priorities. As you can see, you can see four groups here. And uh, in these four groups, uh, the priorities are categorized in two parties or in two categories, which is those, uh, we, those which directly relate to um, climate change and general issues. Starting with men, um, uh, men identified that also, uh, I uh, said that greater access to market and a better price for their productions. They produce in bulk, but sometimes they cannot find a market to, to sell their products. So they identified that as a priority. Also, uh, scientific research and knowledge on their products. Uh, they are doing business as usually. They do not have any skills uh, or knowledge based on, the, on their products. So they, 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 they identified that uh, having scientific research and knowledge on their product is a, a priority for them. Protect the area for prod, uh, product deeds. Um, uh, in local context, um, their products are being installed by people. So uh, uh, identifying or keeping the protection of their products is their priority. Uh, coming to the women, more support from the men and, and boys. Um, uh, for instance, um, in seaweed cooperative, girls would like to learn to swim and drive boats so they can uh, to run, uh, to, to can grow seaweeds in deep water and not be limited to grow in shallow water where temperature are rising and seaweed is uh, growing less, uh, but also informing on meeting times. Most of women and the girls, uh, uh, as well as boys, young people, do not inform to them, um, to attend the meeting, how they get information late. So getting early information is their first priority as they want to be involved in decision-making process. Involved in decision-making, as I said before, there was um, a little bit of gaps, especially in participating in decision-making process. So this uh, participating decision-making process also identified as a priority. Access to land, uh, men or young people can just access land by inherit, which this means that 
most of lands has been taken or uh, has been taken by, by men. And this is a problem. And the skills and training to engage in business activities, they are not familiar with most of the business activities. So they want to get some, some training on how to engage with the business involved in decision making, as I said, as women and girls equipment and the protective gear that fits them. Most of the protective gears that they, they, they have, it's only for, for, for men. So they, did, uh, they said that especially keepers, they could have uh, a protective gear that can fit them as well. And skills and training to engage in all business activities also uh, involved in decision-making process. As we can see women, boys and girls are marginalized in taking uh, part in decision making. So uh, taking part in decision making is a priority for all women, boys and girls. That's mean youth. David, next slide. Lesson learned. It was a big challenge changing the mindset of people on women and youth participation in decision-making process within the cooperatives. Yeah, um, men and yes, men believes that women and youth cannot take part in decision-making the process. So it was a big challenge for us just the, uh, um, uh, keeping the beliefs that women and youth can take part in decision-making process. But uh, um, lastly, uh, they, 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 the mindset is now changing. Also, it needs sometimes for the cooperative to fully achieve the identified priorities during the application of these, uh, of the tools. For instance, uh, there are some constitutions which guide these cooperatives. So they say that in order to change the structure of leadership, we have to wait for the elections. So sometimes it takes time for the, 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 the situation to change. But also another thing is during the application of these tools, when we tested this tool, it was approved that the toolkit can be used in different contexts, whether local, international, or in, in, in different organizations. But uh, more importantly, to ensure that this tool is being used by different people, we also uh, conducted a TOT, a, a TOT, I mean training of trainers, that we equip the different people from uh, government, CSOs, and other institutions, um, and, and we trained them how to use the tools. This will make sure that the tool is being uh, used uh, by different people and change the situations and change uh, the challenges that facing the cooperatives and the other institutions. Thank you for your listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to all of you for listening. Um, at this point, uh, we'd like to welcome some questions and comments uh, from those attending. And I've seen that there's been quite an active uh, debate already happening in the chat box. And my colleague, Sam Green, has already been responding to some of the questions that have arisen. Um, let me have a quick look and see the, some of the ones that might be interesting here to take up. Uh, da, da. Let's see. Um, we have a question from, from Tara Garrity. Would you like to ask a question? Um, yeah, I think that Sam kind of covered it, but I, I work out in an area in Peru and because of time constraints and because my research team is quite small, I can't separate based on gender. Um, so that's something that I struggle with when doing seasonal calendars and also um, participatory mapping. So I just didn't know if anyone had any suggestions that hadn't been mentioned on how to kind of overcome that struggle.
Sam has uh, has replied to that one in the in the text, but I just wonder if there's anybody else here who might have some suggestions that uh, that Tara might find helpful. Yeah, in addition to Sam's suggestion, and I also we we uh, we also struggle with that the gender issues and age in a pastoral community, but the other thing you can do, you need to analyze power the groups who have power in the community, who can uh, neutralize the situation. So you need to invite them uh, during the exercise so that they can neutralize any raising issues. This group can help really in the process. Thank you. I'll look into that. Also okay. to add to that, I think the other thing about gender separation, gender analysis, it is important that you understand the people that are around and see who is talking much compared to the others. Because most people who tend to talk much tend to lower others spirit in speaking. They might find they might have something to speak, but one person is dominating the discussion. So by that the other people will not be able to participate well in the discussion. So by neutralizing the person who is dominant in speaking, we provide an opportunity for others to participate and share whatever they had during the presentation. Thank you, Angela. Any other comments? Uh, I'm going to invite Alice, Alice um, Rowley from the Cities Alliance uh, to ask her question. Hi, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would you like to ask your question? Hi. Hi, yeah, sorry, this is Alice, Cities Alliance. Um, thank you so much for the presentations, everybody. I, I thought they were really interesting and useful. Um, I, I used to work on conflict resolution and I, and I started to wonder how the tool kind of uh, risk assesses in terms of separating different groups in the community. Um, and if the tool has ever been applied in a conflict setting, um, and I understand that this it's it's challenging in any setting when you have, you know you have different power dynamics. But I was just interested to hear, and I think I've already heard a lot uh, from the presenters. So thank you. But if you have any comments on that on conflict um, and planning in advance uh, and thinking through risk mitigation of of possible conflict that arises from the process, thank you. I can take this one, David, or, sure. or start anyway in answering some of this. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, and you raised some very key points. Um, I think initially um, in sort of in planning for carrying out the tool, um, we would invite the community um, and, the sort, and the cooperative to um, select who, you know, the groups um, to take part. But we would have criteria um, that would help with that selection process in order to try and avoid uh, elite capture and bias in selection. So criteria that you know, would, would be about involving voices of the marginalized, um, being quite specific about sort of how you define sort of the, the younger and the older woman and the younger and the older men, uh, trying to be as representative as possible. Um, and the partners and ourselves would work very closely sort of with the, you know, the leaders there in, in trying to get a representative sample. Um, in terms of conflict arising, um, we're very aware of this as well. Um, and initially there would be some uh, questions about why, why, why would, would, would this be necessary? Why do we need to involve women and youth? Um, and making the case very much so about uh, the need for inclusion. Um, that in terms of the cooperative, um, it, you, know, you they think about 
being productive as well. So I guess the, framing the arguments around that about when everyone's involved and everyone's contributing equally, you will be not only much more happy and inclusive cooperative, but also more productive as well. Um, and in terms of working on sort of some of the governance work, um, we haven't tested it specifically in conflict areas. It, it was just in uh, in Zanzibar and in mainland Tanzania. Um, but for the governance, for example, um, the governance analysis, in that was a kind of facilitated in a group discussion um, whereby everyone was able to think through their current leadership structure and where they'd like to go in the future, what kind of representation they'd like to have. So it was very clear, like, because it was based on facts, very clear that, okay, we, we're, we have a gap. There, is, there isn't any youth on our leadership committees. Um, and that was a kind of, people didn't maybe realize that before. So it was a nice kind of eye opener for a lot of people and thinking through then, okay, let's, let's try and be more balanced. Um, but they got to vote when there was disagreement about how that composition should look like. Everyone voted together in the, in the cooperative as well. So that kind of helped as well to sort of uh, one member, one vote system, democratic process. Um, in which to get everyone's input um, into the new into a new structure, um, but it is very key facilitators and having facilitators that can manage those dynamics and anticipate those, those dynamics are also very important um, to try and minimise any any conflict that may arise um, and to and to address it in the right manner. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah uh, Alakara or um, Angela, uh, do you have any comments on uh, situations of conflict, perhaps uh, intra intra community conflict, and experience of, of using the tool in situations where there may be tensions within the communities uh, that that are, are causing issues? Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Sara Alakara. I work with Pastor Inman Shasa. Um, yes, I, I think in in doing this exercise, um, it opens a space for everybody to let out what they think they want to be or the future, the vision. But also, we have a culture here. And um, women will come up with their priorities and sometimes their priorities may be against against the, the the culture so this might bring up tension in within the within the groups or even in the bigger group so what we actually do we because we have traditional leaders and we have women we try to understand first on how to handle the situation, but also we open up the space to uh, let each group understand the priorities of each other, of, of the other group and the reason why they want to to do that. But sometimes the group might go out, out of control. So we use some, uh, powerful and influential leaders or even women to help us neutralize neutralize the situation or any arising conflict within the groups. Thank you, Sarah. Just looking through for other questions. Have a little look. There's some questions there about how young and old are defined. Do we have a question? Yeah, I can just, yeah, I can reply to Hannah. Okay. Um, how do you define younger people in Zanzibar in Tanzania? Um, there are guides, there are policies, which it's dependent upon the country and the context. But in Zanzibar, we use the youth development the policy, uh, which define uh, young people or youth are the people aged 15 to 35. Though, due to uh, regulations, we work much with the people 
who are 18 to 35 in order to get uh, contact uh, co uh, constantly from themselves. Unless otherwise, if you work with the people under that age, you should get the con contact, con con uh, I, I mean the consent from the parents. So we mostly work with the people from 18 to 35. And above that uh, are olders. That means uh, women and men. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello? Hello? Can I add something? Um, of course. Uh, something which also helped us. Um, we have uh, forums and uh, in the ground, women's forum. But what we did, we also recruited uh, four men to be members of the forum. So during the discussion, the, the, the tools discussion processes, we invited these traditional leaders to be part of the processes who are already um, um, speaking about gender equality in the ground. And um, so we had people who can actually stand up and uh, who are men and also traditional leaders who can stand up and say, hey, guys, let's go this way and neutralize and bring uh, the men and women together and or bring men to agree on women's priorities and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm just mindful of the time and it looks as though some people may have to move on to other sessions. Um, so at this point, I just like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to uh, thank all the speakers and all my colleagues for all their hard work. Um, and I would like to draw your attention to these recently, in fact, freshly published and available uh, versions of the toolkit for rural livelihoods. Um, it's there on this, this uh, presentation slide. It's also been put in the chat by Sam for cooperatives. There's a slightly different version. I'd also like to shamelessly plug an IID issue paper, which goes into some detail about the experiences that we had in developing and testing this tool. And uh, there's the, uh, the link there if you want to go and have a look at that. Um, thank you all very, very, very much for attending. Uh, the last thing I guess I should add is that there will soon be Swahili versions of these um, these toolkits. Uh, please stay in touch with us uh, and look on the website uh, to see when they're available. Thank you all very much for a wonderful discussion and um, look forward to taking this up with you uh, individually or in groups later in CBA or elsewhere. Thanks.